Hello, uh, I'm Charlie Radigan. I'm uh, chair of the board uh, here at uh, WCTV and uh, the executive director at the Vermont Institute of Natural Science. And we're here to have a discussion actually about the proposed new middle and high school. And I'm happy to welcome these uh, two uh, very uh, distinguished and fine gentlemen. So this is uh, Ben Ford. Uh, ben is chair of the new build committee for the, uh, the, the school board and Jim Fenn, who is Director of Finance. Directors of Finance are very close to my heart, actually. So yeah. <laughs> thank you very much for, for coming. And Ben, thank you for your time. It's good to be here. So we're going to ask some questions to bring some clarity to uh, this uh, discussion uh, related to uh, the new bond issue that's uh, happening. And uh, the vote is in March, is that right? That's right, March yeah, 5th. March 5th. Well, Ben, let's start with you. Um, at the simplest level, why is a new school needed? Sure, and I think it's important to kind of um, frame the um, picture with uh, what is our school district composed of first. And it goes well beyond Woodstock these days. We have seven towns who are members of our school district. We have Reading, Bridgewater, Killington, um, there's Plymouth, um, Barnard, Pomfret, and uh, Woodstock. And with all those towns, uh, that gives us a, a current population at the middle school and high school building of about 450 kids, uh, over 1,000 children in the six schools of our school district. But the problem with the school building is that it's old and it's uh, pretty much shot. Um, some of the problems that we've experienced uh, most recently, just to give you a few examples, um, we've got um, you know, gym supports that, that are cracking. Um, uh, the snow load is not supported, and as a result, we've had to evacuate games uh, mid-game. Septic lines are, are calcified to the point where we have um, sewage backing up into the bathrooms. And all the systems, a uh, report that was done by the state last year indicate that uh, we're at a point where we need about $16 million worth of uh, short-term repairs, and that's just from a visual inspection. But it's my understanding that uh, actually repairing is not necessarily feasible. No, and the reason for that is uh, another report that, uh, from a year before uh, from the Secretary of Education. There was a comprehensive survey that happened uh, statewide, and it ranked our school facility the second worst in the state. They used something called a facilities condition index that essentially uh, is a, a measure of how much, um, how depleted your building is. Our, and it's scale from 1 to 100, our building is at 96.7 two years ago. And the state has recently come out with new standards for construction aid. Uh, they're in the process of looking very hard at bringing that program back. It's been suspended since 2007, but they've made it clear that no building that has an FCI greater than 65 will be eligible for any um, state assistance. So there would be no state money that would be directed towards renovation? That's correct. So. That leads to the next question, Jim, which I think, uh, is renovation feasible or not feasible? Renovation isn't feasible long term. Short term, we can continue to band-aid the building, but the building, we won't, if state aid comes back, we're not eligible for state aid, and the building's useful life is mostly over and renovating it may extend it a few years, but it doesn't give us a 30 or 40 year building. It gives us a five or 10 year building. And uh, there's still uh, cost implications of that and fairly substantial cost implications. Fairly substantial cost implications. As Ben said, about $16 million, very short term um, cost to repair it. It still does not meet ADA um, or fire compliance or many of these other national standards for safety. And one of the issues with renovating is if we do a major renovation, we have to bring the building in compliance with fire rating, AD and all those, and we may not be able to with this building. Right. So uh, essentially that money would be sort of ill spent. It, it would not really make sense for us to to do that. Is yeah, it? good money after bad yeah. really is that scenario. Mm -hmm. So um, you have been working on this for I know a long time um, and you've done a tremendous amount of uh, research and work uh, and you've come up with, uh, with a plan uh, and a design. 
Uh, why don't you talk about that, if you would? Yeah, the new building is pretty exciting. The work actually goes back before my time on the board, about eight years, when we first started looking at um, you know, answers to the problems that we're beginning to experience with the, with the facility. In, uh, in 2017, we brought in an architect, Lavallee Brenzinger Architects. The architect, Lee architect is uh, Lee Sherwood. He's been wonderful to work with. Um, they're known for building very efficient, uh, economical school buildings. And one of the priorities that we've had from the outset is to achieve net zero with this building, just as we've done with Union Arena across the parking lot. Uh, and that's something that's, um, we, we have a, a completed uh, design. We're at the detailed design phase. And uh, the new building will be all electric. It'll be a mix of geothermal and heat pumps uh, with solar panels on the, uh, on the roof of the facility. Um, new spaces for um, modern teaching and learning. Very different approaches to how uh, kids are, are um, taught these days, particularly in some of the areas that our district really excels at. And people don't talk a lot about it, but uh, special education is an area where our district is a leader in the state. Uh, special education is very different in uh, 2023 than it was in 1958 when that building was built. You need a lot of one-on-one -on -one time. You need time in closed spaces. We recognize that. But all across the curriculum, a uh, very different kind of building. So schools are, by nature, complex buildings. That's right. There's many facets to, to the school. But the bottom line is it creates a, a, a learning environment that's conducive really to growth in, in students. Um, maybe talk about the number of students uh, currently that we serve, what we're preparing for. Yeah, as part of our applications to the state for approval for this project, uh, we look at our current enrollment and then we're required to do uh, enrollment study. There's an entity out of Massachusetts called the New England School Development Council, and they're kind of the source of truth for you know, predicting how you, what your enrollment's gonna do. One of the interesting things that we found, our current uh, school population, as I said, is around 450 students. Uh, but what NESDAQ um, is predicting for us is a gain by 2030 of 120 students. And that's a, a mix of various factors. Um, a lot of things having to do with remote work, uh, that's a, a, a big change. I think we can all look around our neighborhoods and see a lot of new faces yeah, and young absolutely. families. Yeah. Um, and some of the other things that we see that are kind of uh, our early indications that that uh, forecast is accurate are the number of uh, young uh, students that we've got in the uh, in the system and also students uh, uh, kids in daycares we've got two new daycares one in uh, Bridgewater the Bridgewater school opened back up there's the uh, the mill school has opened up in the east end of Woodstock they all have waiting lists and we've got uh, a wait list on our pre-k's of 60 kids so what I've noticed anecdotally of course is uh, an influx of new families with 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 young children and uh, they're here for the quality of life. They may have been raised here and have come back. Um, and they're looking to make this community their home. So how important is this new school for keeping those people active and in, uh, and in the community? I think it's absolutely vital. Uh, I've got uh, two young kids, one in first grade, another in third grade, both are at Woodstock Elementary School. And you know, among our peer groups, you know, that's something that's front and center of all of our discussions, certainly these days. But um, it's a choice that parents, unfortunately, in recent years have, have had to make as kids get to that, um, you know, the, to the seventh grade uh, to say, you know, do I, and particularly in high school, actually, it's more of a ninth grade decision that, that uh, parents are saying, you know, is this, you know, do I feel comfortable having my, my, my kid in this building or are there other options that um, we need to explore? And more and more, unfortunately, we're seeing parents, you know, take other options in the area. Yeah. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the cost and uh, its comparison to other projects. So I think from what I've been able to determine, the costs here to build are, uh, are, are, are very reasonable. They are. We've gone through a, recently a costing exercise where um, we're working with our construction manager and they did a cost projection for this project. And then we did went through a process called value engineering. And so their cost projection came in higher than the number that we're at right now. And as, through a series of meetings, we went through and reviewed what they proposed, made some changes. We actually removed about 5,000 square feet from the building to bring it down to the $99 million that it is now. 
and so we carefully looked at the programs we were trying to offer um, and uh, the size of the building and right now the building is designed to continue offering all the programs that we're offering the usage for each classroom is about 80 percent of the time so we won't have classrooms sitting idle all day every classroom will be scheduled about 80 percent of the time um, the state has recently reviewed construction costs we're looking at an all-in construction cost by all-in i mean that includes furniture and all of what's called soft costs of $627 a square foot. The Burlington project that we've all been watching on the news is a little over $800 a square foot. And the state has now said around $655 a square foot is a reasonable price just for the construction, just for the building, not all the soft costs. So we're building what I would call a Chevrolet. It's a mid-range. Mid it's not the most luxurious, but it certainly is not a shack. It's, an, it's a mid-range uh, building uh, to meet the needs of our communities and the expectations for learning that we have and to meet the needs of Vermont weather and Vermont environment. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so from what I've been able to understand is that there's a need, it's an identifiable need, Renovation is not an option and not a real option. Um, the cost to build, people have been very conscious of what that is and have been able to negotiate what seems to me to be a remarkably reasonable price, and that gives you all in for the, for the school. So people, of course, are, you know, when you say $100 million or $99 million, people go, well, that's, you know, that's a lot of money, uh, which, it, of course, it is. But compared to other places, somebody in Massachusetts building something similar to this, it would still be a hundred million. Oh, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Or Look, more. Yeah. Looking around uh, the New England region, and Massachusetts is a little bit uh, different uh, situation in that they've got um, uh, a sales tax that they impose that kind of um, subsidizes their buildings, and they tend to be a little bit more elaborate. Um, but certainly around the New England region, um, as Jim indicated. When the state set its uh, per uh, foot pricing standards in December for bringing back the construction aid program, our, progr uh, our uh, planned building is uh, cheaper than all the other uh, comparative schools that they looked at on a square foot basis. Yeah. Well, so it goes to the, you know, to the elephant in the room, which of course is uh, its impact on, uh, on the tax base and, and on individual tax players. Um, could you guys? Talk about who wants to start with that. Yeah, I can start. Uh, I think one thing to keep in mind is that uh, Vermont is a pretty complicated place in terms of figuring out how uh, taxes work on your ed tax bill. But uh, the first place to start is uh, that it's a property tax, that uh, only homestead taxpayers uh, residing in the district will be impacted by the tax. And that means that uh, anybody who's renting a property is, is not going to be subject to any impact to the taxes. Um, the other aspect of it is that Vermont has an income sensitivity program that two-thirds of homeowners get some degree of credit off their tax bill based on having an income uh, that is qualified for the program and that starts at $128,000 a year. So anybody with an income less than that can qualify up to $5,600 worth of credit off their tax bill and people who make $47,000 a year or less get an additional $2,400 off of their municipal tax bill. So that's a pretty uh, great program that we have in Vermont and it uh, you know, indicates uh, kind of the affordability of the project, particularly for people on some of the lower uh, end of the socioeconomic spectrum. Some of the other efforts though that uh, a team of people here in our area have done is we're doing some private fundraising. And the private fundraising has already uh, raise commitments of over three million dollars, over three and a half million dollars actually, towards this project. And part of our goal with this fundraising is to help soften the impact in the early years of a bond. So because a bond starts with its highest payment in the first year and it gradually goes down over the life of the bond. And so the fundraising, the intent is to uh, make sure that we build the energy efficient solar and all those things, but also 
to help in, you know, soften that impact as we go forward. A couple other aspects of the board's a school board's plan for uh, making the project affordable for taxpayers. First, and I think the most important thing is that this is uh, something that you know, was one of your ideas, Jim, was that under Vermont law, uh, municipal bonds don't need to be repaid for up to five years. And as a result, we can offer taxpayers a grace period. Uh, in this case, it'll be three years. We'll take, uh, uh, so if the bond passes in March, we're looking at late 2027 before when those tax bills go out before anybody would see any impact, and that gives people time. And I think that's an important factor, particularly with the current state of uh, taxes in Vermont. So is there a, a place that people can go to actually see what the impact might be to them as individual taxpayers? Yes, there is. If on our uh, website, the school district website is uh, mountainviews.org, mtviews.org. And you go to um, scroll down to the breaking new ground. That's the project aspect of the uh, of the website. And within that, you can scroll down to understanding the tax impact. And there's an online calculator. You can download that with the click of a button. Put in your uh, home value, your income level, and it'll tell you what the impact of the bond will be on the 30-year projection. So I think, uh, of course, this is an emotional issue because it has to do with uh, with money. Uh, but I think that, uh, from my perspective, that this uh, project seems to be an essential project for the vitality and health of this community long term. Uh, do you agree with that, or what do you think? Absolutely, Charlie. The, the, it couldn't, I don't think there's anything that uh, could be uh, more important to this community right now, given the recent influx that we've had of families and um, just how much uh, people are looking at this project and, and kind of making uh, big decisions based on it. But what it really comes down to is, you know, given the fact that, you know, we're, we're looking at replacing this facility, it's, it's really a yes or no question, and it's on the, on the ballot in March. It's do we want to continue having a uh, high school in this community, a middle school and high school building? And the answer to that, I believe, everyone should believe is yes. It serves uh, as a, a centerpiece of so much community activity, uh, a draw for so many young families uh, to our area. And I, I guess I, I have a hard time imagining what Woodstock would be like if we, if we didn't have a high school. And, and the danger would be that the high school that currently exists will no longer be viable in, you know, three to five years anyway. Yeah, our, our buildings and grounds crew does an amazing job of yeah. keeping the place online, but they can only do so much. Yeah. So uh, if people want to learn more, uh, where would they go to that? Sure, yeah, that same website, uh, mtviews.org, Breaking New Ground, and there's an FAQ section there. Uh, people can also um, contact the school district. Uh, uh, my email is uh, ben.ford at mtviews.org, and um, uh, happy to take uh, questions there. There's also an email mailbox online uh, that people can submit questions to. Good, and we'll put this on the screen so people can actually see it. In Sounds good. Yeah. yeah. So uh, thank you both. Anything uh, in summary that you'd like to like to say or? Uh... No, I hope we uh, hope we get a big turnout at the polls, yeah. uh, and uh, thanking everybody for their time and attention. Good. Uh, thanks for uh, tuning in, and uh, look for more information uh, on the website, and uh, and send Ben a note if uh, if you've got questions.